Well, hello, I'm Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here at the refinery, and, and I'm excited that you're here with us this morning as we continue this series called Forgotten God. And if you were here last week as uh, our lead pastor, Chad, came out and kind of set this, this series up for us, as we were looking uh, for a way, uh, a series to do on the Holy Spirit and really share some insight with you, we kind of remembered this book. This book was written back in 2009 by a guy named Francis Chan, and we are like, man, what? There's, don't know that there's a better way than to use this resource that's in front of us to talk about the Holy Spirit. And one of the things you might remember if you were here is that Chad shared he has this love-hate relationship with Francis Chan because when you begin reading his material, if you've read any of his books, they can be very challenging. And, uh, you know, we joke in the office, like, We'll read part of a Francis Chan book and we begin questioning, am I even a Christian? Do I really believe in Christ? Because he's that challenging at times, but it can also be so encouraging. It can be so encouraging for us as well. And, and we hope our desire is that's what this series is for you as well. We know that it's gonna be, there's gonna be some challenging stuff, and, uh, but hopefully you leave here maybe a little more encouraged than when you came in. So last week, we kicked it off by talking about the who of the Holy Spirit, just talking about some of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And here in a few minutes, I want to share a little bit of the why of the Holy Spirit. But before I do that, I want to just give you a little bit of my background, uh, of where I came from, and my understanding of the Holy Spirit. Because each of you come in here today with your own bit of understanding. It might be a lot. It might be a large amount of understanding about the Holy Spirit. It might be little to none, depending on your experience, depending on if you grew up in church or where you went to church, you might have a little bit different experience. And so many of you have heard me share my testimony in the past, and I'm not going to get into the details of it, but I gave my life to Christ as a teenager. And when I was a freshman in high school, happened to be going to a church that frankly, believed in the Holy Spirit, but when the Holy Spirit was talked about, it was always talked about in the context, if you read things in the New Testament of what the Holy Spirit was doing in people, the leaders in the church, my Sunday school teacher, everybody like, yeah, that's how the Holy Spirit used to work. He doesn't work that way anymore. That was a different time. That was a different place. That was for a different reason, and he doesn't work that way anymore. And so while they believed in the Holy Spirit, they really didn't talk about him in the aspect that I now see him in scriptures. And so one of the things we also talked about last week is kind of this pendulum that swings across American Christianity from what we would consider maybe hypersensitive to the Holy Spirit to those on the other side, like the church that I grew up in, that I would say is hyper unsensitive to the Spirit. You know, that they acknowledge that he exists, but they really, man, there's some tension in there and I think there's some middle ground because there, there's something about when all we do is depend on feeling and then when we totally don't depend on feeling, we don't allow that to affect us at all because I believe the Holy Spirit works that way in our life. So as always, as I begin preparing a message, and, and I know I've shared with this with you in the past as I speak, man, there's so much that I get in preparing for a message that there are times that God... And in this instance, I feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to me in ways that I don't get at other times. And I don't know why. I don't know if that's a me issue in my preparation process or if it's just God and the Holy Spirit was just working so powerfully because there's a particular passage that I'm going to share with you in just a minute. John chapter 20, uh, and that as I was reading and preparing, I can't tell you how many times I've probably read this particular passage in the book of John but yet there was something that jumped out at me. And I honestly was like, did somebody just write this? Like, is this a new translation? Did somebody update it? I don't remember that being there before. I've never, ever seen that before. So in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22, it says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And this is the line that got me. This next line I'm about to read is the one that got me because I'd never seen that. And it says, and with that, he breathed on them 
and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I'd never seen that before. I don't know why. I don't know if I just skipped over it. Man, that jumped out to me. So I kind of want to set the context of what's going on here. So when it says, the beginning of that verse, on the evening of the first day of the week, what if, if you go back and read the whole chapter, chapter 20 of John, what you're going to see, this is resurrection day. This is the day we're talking about. This is resurrection day. This is the morning that Mary Magdalene had run to the tomb. And when she gets there, she finds a tomb rolled away. Jesus is gone. And she's told, go tell the others, go tell his disciples. His disciples are on their way to the tomb. They run into Mary. She tells them he's gone. They run to the tomb. And in fact, they go in the tomb as well. It says they saw the burial clothes, the linens are lying there. He's gone. And so now we know why they're in this room with the doors locked in fear for the Jewish leaders because their fear was that the Jewish leaders were gonna come after them and going, hey, you went and stole his body. And so we're gonna come and arrest you. So they're locked in a room and it doesn't say Jesus came through the door. We don't know how Jesus got in the room, but it says Jesus is there with them like that, which is probably why he said, peace be with you. And so our mind is like, he's probably like, calm down guys, it's okay, calm down. He shows them his hands, he shows them his side. They get loud again. I can only imagine this, I picture this on my mind because he says it almost back to back again. He goes, peace be with you, calm down, it's okay, I'm here. And then he says, it says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I can't help but think, like in this moment, we see the disciples receive the Holy Spirit for the very first time. He'd been telling them up to his death, like, when I go, the comforter's gonna come. Somebody else is gonna come. The counselor's gonna come. Now he's dead. He comes back and he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And I can't help but think about like Genesis 2, 7, that word breathe, it's the same idea in the Hebrew as it is in the Greek as it talks about when God breathed life into his creation for the very first time. When God breathed life into humanity for the very first time. It's that same picture. And now we see Jesus breathe a new life into his followers. I'm like, man, why have I not seen that before? That is such a powerful picture. Ezekiel 37, nine. Some of you may be familiar, you might not know that passage right offhand, but maybe you've heard the story of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And it talks about the bones, like the four winds came and it breathed life and the bones came back to life. It's that same picture again, this breathing of life. That's what Christ just did. And so for followers of Christ, we should be encouraged, we should be rejoicing because you see that same spirit, the very same spirit that is, in the resur- that is in the resurrected Jesus is now in us too. And we see that happen with the disciples. Now, I don't know about you. I've been around church for a number of years now, and I have, regardless of somebody's background and where they come from and their understanding of the Holy Spirit, I have yet to have any believer come to me and go, you know what, I'm good with God. I'm good with Jesus. I really don't want the Holy Spirit in me. Like, I, that's why, okay, I'm good just with the two, and I, I, we'll just go on with life. Anybody I've ever talked to, like, if you talk to them, like, do you want the Holy Spirit in your life? Sure, I want the Holy Spirit in my life. Sure, I want the Holy Spirit to be a part of my life. And so that raises a question for me, for us today. And the question is, is why do you want him in your life? The why of the Holy Spirit. Why do you want him in your life, and that's gonna be kind of the focus of the rest of this message. Some of you follow Francis Chan, you know who he is, you know a little bit about his story. He started a church in Southern California, and then over the last couple of years, he's transitioned out and is doing some other things. When he wrote this book, he was still at that church. And he shares a story in that book that's really powerful and very challenging. He shares a story about a guy that's been diagnosed with cancer. He's been told that he's terminal, that there's no options, there's nothing they can do uh, medically for him to be healed. And the guy reaches out to the church, reaches out to Francis Chan and the elders of that church and says, I want you to come. I want you to come anoint me with oil. I want you to pray for my healing. And so these guys go and they show up at the hospital and, and they're getting ready, preparing to, to, to pray over this guy and anoint with him with oil. And Francis Chan shares that He steps back and he asks the guy a question. He asks the guy, 
Why do you want to be healed? Why do you want to stay on this earth? Wow, that's, I mean, I can only imagine that in that moment. That was not in my Christian ministry practicum class on hospital visits. That is, you're dealing with somebody that's been given a diagnosis of terminal illness that you're just going like, why do you want to keep living? But I think it's a challenging question. It's a challenging question for each of us because I think it's really a question that each of us can ask ourselves is, are we really living each day to make the most out of our life here today in a way that points back to Christ or are we living for ourselves? Because that's really what he's asking this guy. Are you wanting to be saved of yourself? Are you wanting to be saved to be able to point back to Christ and show some amazing things? There's a lot of times that we go into things with the wrong motives. We'll even ask for good things for the wrong reason and desire good things for the wrong reasons. And so there's a lot of times that we ask for things that we're asking for for us. That we want them to be, we want it to be about us. And so I want to share a couple of the wrong reasons for wanting him. A couple of the wrong reasons for wanting the Holy Spirit in your life today. First, attention. Attention. There are people in the church there are leaders in churches that I honestly believe they want the Holy Spirit to show up on a regular basis in their life so people look at them and go, man, you are really holy, you are really connected to God, man, I wanna be like you, instead of them going, man, I wanna be like Christ. And so they do it for attention. John 16, 12 through 14, Jesus speaking, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he... The spirit of truth comes. He, I love that. Like, remember, the Holy Spirit is not a thing. It's not an it. It's a person. And we see that as Jesus is addressing this. He says it over and over again. The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Now, there's a lot of things in there. You take a little bit of time to, to unpack that, but there's something really powerful that stands out into that. And something that, that I've just learned over time as I begin to read and study about the Holy Spirit, and I would encourage you to dig in, especially in the New Testament, and look at the, how the Holy Spirit works. But the Holy Spirit always works in ways that point back to Christ. Every single time, the Holy Spirit always does things in a way that bring attention to Christ, not to himself. He never, ever draws attention to himself. And many of the people who emphasize the Holy Spirit in their religious walk are doing it, or at least it seems like they're doing a lot of things that draw attention to themselves and don't always point to Christ. And so, as I've been on this journey from where I grew up in church and not really knowing much about the Holy Spirit and told over and over that the Holy Spirit really doesn't work that way anymore. He's like, he's there, but he really doesn't do a whole lot right now. He's, he's hanging out. In my journey, as I began learning a little bit more and growing a little bit more and just through a number of years of having opportunity to, to begin studying on my own, I was doing an undergrad class, uh, working on my degree, and, and I had an opportunity to take a class, a religious class that was based on the Holy Spirit. It was a three-credit hour class on the Holy Spirit. And that really began to shape the way I, it changed the way, it reshaped the way I began to look at the Holy Spirit. Because the bottom line of that class, one of the very first days, the very first thing that professor said is, he talked to us about the reticence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, about how the Holy Spirit never does anything to bring attention to himself. And I can't help but think, man, we have so much to learn from the Holy Spirit. We have so much to learn from the Holy Spirit uh, of how he wants to work so powerfully in our lives, but yet we always need to work in a way that that points back to Christ. The second wrong reason for wanting him in your life, miracle hunting. Miracle hunting. So just looking for divine intervention. There's nothing wrong with wanting the Holy Spirit to, to work in your life, in, in your life and through your life. The problem comes when we seek out and are constantly pursuing 
miracles. We're, we're basically miracle hunting. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, the story is written about the temptation of Christ where he goes in the wilderness for 40 days and there's a couple of exchanges he has with Satan in that, in that time where Satan says, okay, if you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, do this. In verse 7, it says, Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Don't go miracle hunting. Even in that moment, Jesus is, you know, the, Satan's taking him up on a high point, showing him everything. He's like, I can give all this to you. I can give all this to you. You know what, if you're the son of God, just throw yourself down and have God come and save you. And his response is, don't put the Lord your God to the test. And that's actually a quote from Deuteronomy 6.16, where that's said another time, which is actually pointing back to an earlier time in Exodus, when they're in the wilderness, and they're questioning God, and they're like, come on, God, just show up, like do another miracle. And see, that's the problem, is a lot of times we'll experience something really powerful things that we would even classify as a miracle or a movement of the Holy Spirit, and what happens the next thing is like, do it again. Like, like do that again, like, that was so cool. And I, and I could say that from my own experience. There used to be an organization in town here called Phoenix One that was really a ministry to like 23-year-olds to about 30-year-olds uh, in the workplace, and there would be a 1,000 of them in, in this historic chapel in downtown Phoenix doing worship, and they would bring in bands, they would bring in musicians from all over, and I would go down there to hang out with them and introduce myself and introduce them to the refinery. And I would get to go down and be a part of this worship. And there were times in there that I would just feel this overwhelming sense and movement of the Holy Spirit in that place. Like I had never felt it anywhere else in worship, but I'm guilty that I would come back and even in this place or the next time I went to Phoenix, I was like, do it again. Like, just do that again. I wanna, I wanna feel that way again. I wanna experience that movement again. The problem is, is when we get focused on do it again, when we go miracle hunting, we become so focused on what he did in the past that we miss what he's doing right now. We miss what he's trying to do in us right now because we're so focused on what we experienced some other time. So let's look at a couple of the right reasons for wanting him in our life. First, for the common good of the church. For the common good of the church. There's another pastor in Southern California, his name's Rick Warren, pastor at Saddleback Church, written a number of books. He wrote a book in the early 2000s that kind of swept across the American church called The Purpose Driven Life. Anybody in here read The Purpose Driven Life? A number of you, okay. So it's a great book, I would encourage you to read it, but I'm gonna spoil it for you real quick. If you read the very first paragraph, what you need to learn is Rick Warren writes this book about how do you draw closer to God? How do you become more of the Christian that you desire to be? Right in the very first chapter, Rick Warren goes, it's not about you. The very first thing you do, you have to recognize that it's not about you. So it's about the common good of the church. See, your faith was designed to be personal, but it was never designed to be private. You have your own unique relationship with Christ, but it was never designed to be private. It was designed to be a part of the body. It was designed to be for the common good of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. 1 Corinthians 14, 12b says, Since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. The second right reason for wanting him in your life is because you care about and love the church. Because you care about and love the church. I'm gonna read a passage in a minute from a guy named Paul as he writes the church at Philippi. If you were here for our last series, Fake News, as we were going through the book of Colossians, Paul wrote that letter as well. He wrote the majority of what we call the books in the New Testament. A lot of them are actually letters to churches that he had planted, and you'll probably remember there's some things in there that he does some correcting, but he also does some encouraging and uplifting. And what we're gonna see in this minute is just this, this love and care that Paul has for the church. In Philippians 1, 23 through 25, Paul says, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you 
that I remain in the body. Now, I'm gonna stop right there for a minute. I'll come back and read the rest of it and say, I want you to understand, so he's saying, so I've got two options. I'm ready. I'm good. If, if Christ were to take me home right now, I am good with that. I have done what God has asked me to do. My mission here and, and my mind is over. I've completed what I need to complete. And you know what? It would be far better for me just to go be with Christ now. And he says, but it's more necessary. I love you so much. I care about this body so much that it's necessary that I remain in the body. It goes on and it says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. You're gonna draw closer to God because I'm here for the common good of the church because I love and care about the church. Man, what an example of love for the church. There's so many in our culture today that is so counter-American church culture today. There's so many people that, that show up at a church and we're thankful that you're here, but there's so many people that show up at church and it's about what can you do for me? What can you give to me? How can you add to me? What can you do for my kids? What program can you offer my kids? And when I don't feel like you can offer me anything anymore, then I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna find somebody else that does instead of understanding that it's not so much about what the church can do for you, it's about what you contribute to the church. It's about you being a part of this body. It's about you being here for the common good of the church. And what we'll see over and over when you read through the New Testament and you see the Spirit, what you see is that the Spirit works in us so that we may know Jesus more deeply. But also so that we can make Jesus known. So are you following him or are you attempting to lead him? If you have the Holy Spirit in your life right now, if you're a Christian, are you following him or are you attempting to lead him? There's a couple of things about the Holy Spirit. He is not a passive power. He is not a power that we can use and utilize how and when and where we choose. The Holy Spirit requires, he, he's a being that requires us to surrender to his leadership. Even those of us in the room, if I ask you how many of you are a type A personality, and maybe you don't know it, but the person sitting next to you knows that you're a type A personality, you know that like you walk into a situation, you immediately like, you're okay, I'm, I can take this on, I can, I can help lead this, I can help take charge, that, that even those people who are natural leaders don't get to lead the Spirit. So what does it look like to follow him? What does it look like to surrender to the Holy Spirit, to have him in our life and go, okay, I'm gonna surrender and I'm gonna follow you. First, we're tuned in and we're listening to him. We are tuned in and we are listening to him. And that can take some time. That took time for me because of my baggage and my background and everything I had learned. It was a little awkward. Like, there were times like, I don't know, is that the Holy Spirit? Is that God talking? I don't know. It takes a little bit to get tuned into him. And he talks to us in so many different ways. He can talk to us through scripture like he did me this week as, as just as I'm preparing for this message and I read that scripture and it's like opens up something that I'd never be, seen before. He can talk to us through a message or a sermon as... Some of you have heard me talk about Francis Chan. Not only do, has he impacted me through his books, he's, I feel like, very prophetically spoke to me in person at a conference as he was on stage talking to me. Sometimes it's through another believer. Additionally, some of you have heard me tell stories about my wife and I's friend Kim who has very specifically spoken to my wife and I's life about certain things that came true and I don't have time to talk about that right now, but if you wanna know more about that, come talk to me after because it's really cool. He also talks to us through circumstances. Oftentimes through circumstances we would never choose to put ourselves in, but he talks to us through those circumstances. Second way it looks like, what it looks like to follow him is that we trust him. Because to truly follow somebody you have to trust them. You gotta trust them. And thirdly, 
We will follow him when and where he leads. And here's the difficult part, or the hard part, even when it's difficult. That, that we're going to follow him wherever he leads, even when it's difficult. Because quite frankly, that's, that's part of Christianity that we don't always talk about when we're, when we're talking to somebody and sharing Christ with them. We don't always talk to them like, you know what? This is going to be great, but man, it's probably going to be difficult too. There's going to be some challenges that you're going to face that you were not expecting to face. Because see, he leads us in ways that are countercultural. He leads us in ways that are counter to what our flesh, what our human desire wants. As I mentioned earlier, most of us would probably say, yeah, we want, to be, we want this Holy Spirit. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit. We want him in our lives. However, a lot of us, if we actually step back and even looked at our own actions, our actions would say something different. We say we want to follow him, but our actions say, no, I want to lead him. Because you see, quite frankly, we want to move. We want, to, we want him to move and work in our lives in ways that we desire, in ways that please us, in ways that make us happy. And while a lot of us would say we want to be led by him, that, quite frankly, scares a lot of us. And it scares us because what if, what if he asked you to give up something you weren't ready to give up? What if he asked you to walk away from your job to go do something else? What if he asked you to pack up and move to another part of the country or another part of the world. I think sometimes we get, it's easy for us to, to get here in this place even and go, you know what, this is where I'm called, this is where I'm supposed to be. I feel like this is where the Spirit has called me and that may very well be what has happened. And so we just kind of settle in. I'm called to be in this place. And uh, I wanna read to you actually a quote again from, from Chan's book because he addresses this idea of this is where I'm called and what typically or can happen when we settle in. He says it's absolutely vital to grasp that he didn't call you there so you could settle in and live out your life in comfort and in superficial peace. So that's a problem sometimes. If you're like, okay, God's called me here. Now I'm here. Okay, now I can relax. Like I can settle in now. Like I'm where God called me. I, we forget that arriving where the Spirit called us, being where the Spirit called us, that isn't the end game. That's not the end of the road. There's more to do. If you're still living and breathing, he has something for you to do. You know, when it comes to following the Holy Spirit, to being led by the Holy Spirit, I don't know about you, but man, I prefer multiple choice. Whether it's being led by the Holy Spirit or it's a test, how many in here would, would agree with me? Multiple choice every time, right? Why? Because it gives me some options. If I don't like choices A and C, I can look at choices B and D. And there are times that, that the Holy Spirit, that God may work that way in your life where there are two or three equally good options and God just kind of lays them out for you and goes, okay, here you go, pick and roll with it and make the most of it. But unfortunately, that's not how he normally works. How the Spirit normally works is that he calls and leads us to something specific. That he calls and leads us to something particular. And I know in my own life, as that friend specifically said, this is what God has told me you're supposed to go do. It was so specific, and I think that's why the Spirit works this way. Because when it happened, there's nothing you can do but step back and go, there's no way that was a coincidence because it was too specific to be a coincidence, that was the Holy Spirit leading me in this place. And so when those types of things happen, when the Holy Spirit's leading us and there aren't a choice between options, our only choice is to obey or to not obey. And so are we, are you, willing to surrender and follow him no matter what. His ultimate desire is that each of you would know Jesus more deeply 
and that we would then go and make Jesus known. And so I'll go back to that very first question. Why do you want him in your life today? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just come to you today. We thank you for being in this place. We thank you for, Father, showing us um, what it means to trust and love you and to point to Christ the way the Spirit does. Father, my prayer is that each person in this room would be drawn closer to the Holy Spirit through this series. Father, that regardless of their previous understanding or or knowledge of the Holy Spirit, Father, that we wouldn't be closed off, that we would be open to your prompting, we'd be open to, to your leading, to your guidance, that we'd just be open to understanding a little bit more about who the Holy Spirit is and, and Father, how you desire to have him to be a part of our life. Father, that as we follow the Holy Spirit, surrender to the Holy Spirit, Father, that we would know your son, Christ Jesus, more deeply. That our relationship with him would grow in ways that we can't even imagine. But also, Father, as we leave this place, that we would go and we would make him known to the world. We lift this to you now in your son's name. Amen.